Okay, now I'm working? Okay, good. I think after this many years, I'd be able to get that right, but you know, whatever. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be continuing on in 1 Timothy. Uh, today we'll be doing chapter 4. Um, been kind of diving into this book where Paul deal, details what he wants the church to look like ongoing, um, setting up uh, how an orderly worship works. Uh, and last, the last few times we looked at leadership in the church, the elders and uh, the role, uh, potential role or office of deacons, what that means for the church. And uh, he's kind of been going through this uh, church structuring, but uh, now he'll kind of take a break from that and uh, move to a different topic. Unfortunately, Paul kind of you know, things like I do, he'll jump from one topic to another and then he'll come back to, you know, the initial topic. So we'll be back to more instructions for the church in chapter five, but uh, he kind of takes a break here and uh, talks about the uh, reactions that uh, the church itself may have to the message that they're receiving. And, uh, you know, as someone who, you know, stands up here and, uh, you know, teaches a message, you wonder all the time, it's like, am I doing it right? You know, how's it going to be received? And, you know, you know are people going to like it? Are people going to walk away as a result of it? And, uh, you know, it's an important question. And uh, Paul kind of goes through that in this chapter. So we're going to uh, read the verses and then we'll uh, pray and dive into that. Uh, chapter four, beginning in verse one. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will be depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the word and faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds, pr holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you because of your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which has been given you by prophecy by the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and uh, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to read it, to examine it, to uh, exhort each other in it, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much for that, and I pray that uh, you will bless this message unto your glory. Let everyone get what they need out of it uh, to grow closer to you and to just draw us ever closer and closer to you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll start uh, up in verse 1. This uh, you know, doesn't tend to be the thing you want to hear as a teacher, or as a church, that uh, people are going to walk away from your ministry. Um, that uh, first phrase there, now the Spirit expressly says, um, that's important because it's God declaring it. The Spirit it's referring to as the Holy Spirit. So um, no matter what we do, no matter, you know, 
how good we present our message, there are going to be people who walk away if we're presenting it right. Um, kind of a complimentary uh, verse to this is 1 John 1.19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So um, John confirms what Paul's saying here. Eventually, there are going to be people who walk away. And there are good reasons for walking away from a church, but there are also bad reasons. So let's uh, look at the reasons he presents here. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, or in some for. Uh, versions it says in the last times in the last days just referring to the time after Christ <clears throat> some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons or uh, some versions also say doctrines of demons uh, Paul has uh, no patience for false teaching and uh, I don't think here he's referring to a particular teaching but rather anything that adds or subtracts or changes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, it's very similar to what he's saying in uh, Galatians 1.8 when he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let them be accursed. Um, so <clears throat> basically these uh, folks are endorsing false teaching, um, through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness are seared. So um, whether within the church or out of the church, they're finding these false teachers. And uh, Paul will describe these false teachers a lot more later in uh, 1 Timothy and a lot in 2 Timothy. These are the uh, ear scratchers, the ones that are telling you what you want to hear when you want to hear it. Uh, it says they're liars whose consciousness, consciousness are seared so they've been preaching so long they aren't convicted of their lies they don't feel bad for anything they do um either they fully believe it or they fully believe that their deception is justified so unfortunately um when you're dealing with uh, teachers whose consciences are seared you also end up with a lot of hearers whose consciences end up seared as well they get stuck in those beliefs and no amount of conviction or showing them verses or anything will dissuade them from their errors. Um, so what exactly does Paul use as examples here? He's not really throwing out their, you know, Moloch worship or the sacrifice of infants or anything. The things he brings up that uh, some of these folks might be pushing is Forbid, forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So, you know, it may seem like, you know, the little things in life, but, uh, you know, as far as marriage goes, Satan will do anything he can to destroy marriage. He hates marriage. It's that picture of Christ in the church. He will redefine it. He will remake it in his image. He will tear it apart. He will end it. He will do whatever he can to throw marriage under the bus. And we know from history, this is uh, something that actually entered the church. They forbade the leadership of the church from marrying, and it caused all sorts of problems, all sorts of infidelity. Um, you had cardinals and popes and monks with mistresses and a lot of the children from those affairs were dumped in rivers and sewers and all sorts of stuff to hide their hide their sins. So what seems like a small thing ended up being a really big thing. And uh, even as far as the foods go, it's, uh, you know, every religion in the world pretty much except for Christianity has food laws, Judaism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Mormonism. Um, even secularism, you know, you can get into all these different diets and stuff, and uh, it's a very easy point of entry for self-righteousness in your life. You know, I'm not eating things, and those people shouldn't be eating things, and I'm better than them for not doing it. And even the Pharisees, you know, they love their food laws, they love their Sabbath laws, the little simple things that can make them better than everybody else. 
And, you know, it's like, when you take that to God, you know, you might say, you know, God, I, you know, treated my neighbor like dirt and I did basically ignored you all day, but I didn't have a, ba <laughs> a bacon, any bacon on my sandwich today. So let's break even, you know, it's, it's the little things like that, that uh, end up destroying your relationship to God and pushing yourself into self-righteousness. So um, Paul points out here that uh, everything's Everything created by God is good. We have a pot on the floor. Rejected, um, it is received with thanksgiving. Um, first of all, this is kind of a continuation of his idea there. It's like, well, why are you rejecting stuff that God yeah, created? Enjoyed? I think it's also a jab at uh, uh, Gnostic heresy here. that was going around at the time. You Gnostic, still have an orchid bloom over here. Uh, heresy believed that all matter was yeah. evil. Yeah, so there, there's, there's, uh, foods would be evil, marriage would be evil wanted, because it involves, you know, physical, material. So all of that would have been evil. Paul it will. Nothing is evil in and of itself it if will. it's receptive, it just takes a accepted. Long time. Yeah, that's where we and, didn't uh, throw it. Verse five, there he kind of brings together. It is made holy by God. Um, even yeah, they go torment for a long time. Of themselves, you know, when you know you make a statement like that, where you say, "Well, no, marriage is you know good, and eating these foods is good." You'll inevitably have somebody on the other end of the spectrum that says, "Okay, marriage good, singleness bad," or you know, eating these foods is good, abstinence from that food is bad. But uh, God has given us freedom within that to be single, to be married, to abstain from I foods. Meant but uh, to it. that's not what makes it good or bad. It's uh, it. things are made holy by the word of God in prayer. Um, I think what he means by that is uh, that uh, we take everything to God in prayer. We take our marriages to God in prayer. We take what we eat and we do things according to his will. We seek his will in all the things we do, even the little things in life, and uh, taking it to the word of God. God has rules for food. God has rules for marriage. Um, God does not want you to eat food that's going to cause your brother to stumble. God does not want you to eat food in excess that it becomes an idol in your life. And, you know, God's got tons of different things on marriage. But uh, so if we approach things seeking God in prayer and being thankful, as well as going to the word and seeing what uh, God has to offer will um, be in a much better position. So just to kind of sum up this uh, section, you know, in terms of uh, one response to the doctrine Timothy is preaching is basically that it will be rejected by people who decide they're going to be, you know, uh, believe false teaching instead of the real teaching. And, you know, you can bring your scriptures to them. You can point it out, point out the problems to them. But if their consciences are seared, they don't care. You know, Paul's wrong. God's wrong. I want to do it this way. So we need to structure the church around that. And that's what was happening here is they wanted the church to forbid marriage. They wanted the church to forbid eating these things. And the church, you know, Hopefully, um, as the churches, Timothy and Paul are presenting it here, would reject that and say, no, we're, we're not changing the word of God because you've decided you're going to follow this false teaching. And ultimately, at least some of the people will leave because of that. They'll go find their false teachers. They'll go find their ear scratchers. They'll uh, do what they need to to accomplish what they really want, which is self-indulgence. But... Uh, <laughs> Ultimately, uh, a good summary of that would be, or of the correct way would be, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, you know. Put that focus on God. Do things according to his way, not your own way. So uh, <clears throat> here we're going to switch gears to um, another response he expects people to have to um, this particular uh, message that he has brought to them. So you've got the people who are going to say, nope, we're not going to do it. We're going to reject that and uh, our way or the highway. But uh, 
This one, uh, verse six, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. So compare that to the doctrine of demons. This is the good doctrine. This is uh, what you're doing if you're following what Christ has to say. And what Christ has to say is um, that we will take what we learned and present it to our brothers. You know, we will share that scripture with one another. We will dwell on that. We will take it to um, a lost world. Um, that particular phrase, put these things before the brothers, uh, is specifically meaning not in, a, not in an aggressive way. You know, you aren't shoving this down somebody's throat. You aren't beating somebody over the head with the message you've received. You're just excitedly showing it around. And, you know, kind of the example I thought of was, you know, a three-year-old finds a really cool rock. <laughs> And that three-year-old's got to show everybody that rock. They got to show their family that rock. They got to show their friends that rock. They got to show some stranger they'd never met before on the street that rock because it's a really cool rock and they found it and they just have to hand it around to everybody. You know, that's the excited nature we're supposed to take the gospel, take the message that Paul has given Timothy here and just share it. Hey, did you know what Paul said to Timothy today? You know, just bring it before one another and excitedly share it with one another. That's uh, what he wants us to do. Um, sometimes it's uh, so much easier for that child with a rock than it is for, you know, an adult in a workplace to go forth and uh, share that. But uh, that's where um, this uh, training ourselves comes in. We need to train ourselves to godliness. And uh, before that, he um, specifically mentions have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. So some translations do say uh, godless myths. Some say uh, old wives' tales, superstitions, etc. cetera. Um, the same type of thing was mentioned at the beginning of 1 Timothy, where uh, false teachers were trying to bring this stuff into the church. And basically, they're trying to bring in these legends, these teachings, these tales, of morality or whatever, anything to replace, you know, the word of God. It's like, well, I've got, you know, in today's culture, it might be popular psychology or business advice or whatever. If I'm up here, you know, giving you good marketing advice during the second hour, you know, it might be helpful in the business world, but, you know, you aren't growing yourself spiritually at all. You know, there's nothing there that contributes to your spiritual well-being. Um, me and Jerry had this long running joke with my Mountain Dew that it's actually a fruit salad because it's got a picture of several different fruits on there. But, uh, you know, it, it's the same thing with a lot of these ideas. We slap spiritual on things. We slap the name Christian on things. And at the end of the day, you know, if I'm trying to get physically healthy, that's not only not going to be helpful, it's going to be detrimental to my health. You know, I, 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 I fooled myself, but I'm not going to fool my body when I take it. Um, but the, uh, all this, you know, these silly myths, this moralism, this psychology, all this stuff, it's like all this fluff we get in there to, you know, replace the word of God and whatnot. It's like, leave that alone, you know, get rid of that stuff. If you want to grow spiritually, um, I think we go back to, uh, verse five, you know, it is made holy by the word of God and prayer, and we are too are made holy by the word of God and prayer. Um, we, you know, we take that message to our brothers. That's what, you know, ultimately our um, true spiritual training ends up being. Um, <clears throat> rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way and holds promise for this life and the life to come. So if you're training, I'm, I can tell you, I'm not particularly good at training. I am not in shape. <laughs> I'm not gonna be running any marathons, but ultimately training uh, involves time plus effort. You're going to have to invest your time into spiritual growth and you are gonna have to invest effort into that spiritual growth if you want to do it. Uh, you know, sometimes we 
think after you know a week of some bible reading and praying three or four times we're going to end up as billy graham and you know you see that with people exercising too they exercise for two weeks and wonder why they're not 40 pounds lighter it's something that takes time something that takes effort and investment um in the word of god in prayer in fellowship with one another we need to invest in that and take time away from those silly myths that fluff in our lives that really isn't benefiting anybody and if anything it's you know a detriment to us <clears throat> i think i'll take a drink of this <laughs> it'll get me through the sermon <laughs> Yeah, and I set myself up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, verse 9, we got uh, kind of our phrase of 1 Timothy. Paul loves this phrase. This, this saying is trustworthy and full of, or deserving of full acceptance. So this is, I think, the third or fourth time Paul has used that in this book, and it's he throws that out there before he's about to say something important. He wants you to remember this. He wants you to walk away and get this memorized. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living at God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So, yes, we need to invest the time we need to invest the effort we need to toil and strive but we keep our eyes on the prize which is ultimately god himself um just uh found some similar verses uh back from colossians 3 1 and 2 if you have been raised with christ seek the things that are above where christ is seated at the right hand of god set your minds on things above not on the things of this earth so we're toiling, we're striving, we're putting our focus on God, who is our ultimate goal and, uh, and is our savior, it says here, of every man, but especially those who believe. And in very real ways, God has blessed even the unsaved beyond imagination. You know, he causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He hasn't judged them um, or us for our sins yet. So he has withheld judgment until we die. Um, he has given us, you know, air to breathe. He's given us lots of stuff in life. And uh, the, you know, ultimately the worst sinner on earth is blessed more than the best, <laughs> best Christian should be, you know, in our sin. But uh, to those of us who believe, you know, our present suffering isn't worth comparing to the glory that'll be revealed in us. There'll... We have treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. And uh, ultimately we look forward to our adoption as, as sons and the redemption of our bodies. So we have, as much as we have, God has blessed us even just as people, as believers, he has blessed us with so much more and we praise him for that. And that's the focus we're supposed to have on this. So we have our uh, two responses here. The, uh, you know what, I'm leaving. Yeah, I, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And then you have the good servant of Jesus Christ who's sharing with one another. But uh, this last section kind of, Paul uh, targets Timothy directly and starts talking to him directly um, in response to what we've learned. Um, beginning in verse 11. Command and teach these things. So, well, everybody in the church is supposed to be, you know, sharing these things uh, uh, with one another and uh, showing God's love to one another through those things. This is uh, a command to Timothy as a leader in the church. Uh, is these things need to be ultimately commanded. When God commands something, the leadership of the church needs to be enforcing that. Um, and uh, teach these things. So basically the church, in order to command them, needs to teach these things to the um, congregation and make sure they know them. Um, here, 
In the next five verses, he'll talk about teaching like half a dozen times. He keeps coming back to that teaching. Watch your teaching. Push your teaching. You know, it's, uh, you know, actually thinking about it, uh, that some, this section could be t titled more more about Jesus. <laughs> keep preaching it. Keep doubling down on it. People are leaving. Well, let's make them leave twice as fast. You know, we are going to get that message out there and make them take it. <laughs> so, uh, Verse 12, let no one despise you for your youth, but set, <clears throat> Oops, lost my place. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So that's a good message to younger people who, you know, might struggle with, uh, you know, not being able to get up and speak or not being able to do things as well as people have been doing them for 30 years um, to get up and uh, serve God where they're called. Um, I think uh, it's also a warning to Timothy against uh, what's called ad hominem attacks. So basically, uh, it's an argumentative tactic that if I can't beat you in the argument, I'm just going to make fun of you. <laughs> you know, it's like I present, you know, the message of first timothy and someone gets up and says you know what i'm not listening to you you're uneducated you're boring you're you know you don't know what you're talking about it's like anything to address the argument themselves in timothy's case this would have been well somebody could have stood up and said well i'm not listening to anything from someone half my age you know not addressing their argument not addressing anything just you know i'm not going to listen to you because you're young and jesus himself had that happen to him a number of times. Uh, the response in his hometown was virtually, oh, isn't this Jesus who, Joseph and Mary's son, whose brothers and sisters we know, how dare he call us out? You know, they weren't listening to his message. They weren't uh, hearing what he had to say. They just dismissed him because he was Joseph and Mary's son. Um, another example that could have ended badly was uh, Nathaniel, told Philip when uh, Philip told him that, uh, you know, we have found Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, and Nathaniel was like, Nazareth? What good can come out of Nazareth? But Philip insisted that he come and see, and three or four verses later, he was on his knees saying, my Lord and my God. But he almost rejected it because he just dismissed it out of hand because of, you know, something stupid, something that wasn't even part of the argument. So, Paul says uh, to Timothy, the solution to that is to live a life worthy of the gospel, to live, uh, be an example in, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. You know, it's a lot harder to make arguments against somebody who's living that kind of life, especially when, you know, all you have is some simple, well, he's not very old. <laughs> you know, if they're living the living a great Christian life, what what or how is that going to stand up? Well, very poorly. So ultimately the cure for arguments like that is a lifestyle that honors God. Uh, verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. So there we have our teaching again. I think uh, Charlie pointed this out the last time he was here, the reading of scripture is just as important if not more important than anything i have to say on it so we like to start um generally uh the sermon with reading the word of god presenting you with the word of god un unchanged as it is in scripture not only does that you know benefit all of us personally but it also holds me accountable it's a lot harder for me to lie about this when i'm reading it to you verse by verse as it stands so um, the reading of scripture is important, the exhortation, so uh, we're promoting it, we're um, encouraging people to live by it, and of course, once again, the teaching. We got to teach from the word, we got to give more and more about Jesus. We got to tell more, we got to share more, we got to teach everything about him. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 14, do not neglect the gift that you have that was given by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Well, I'm not sure anyone has a gift here given by prophecy. If they 
do. You can talk to the elders afterwards, but all of us have a uh, gift given from God. And uh, it's a real shame. Most Christians in most churches, a lot of people just come in, sit down, listen to a message and leave. None of those gifts are ever used. None of those gifts are ever valued or anything like that. Uh, Paul is telling Timothy, value that gift, use that gift, find a way to enrich the body with that gift. Um, do not neglect it. Everybody has one, everybody needs to be using one and uh, look for ways to do that. If you need help, find somebody to help you with it, but make sure you're using that gift. We are a body ministry and we really need that. <laughs> All right, um, verse 15. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Um, immerse tends to be a word we trot out every time we have a baptism, otherwise you don't hear about it much. Um, we practice baptism by immersion. You push them fully under the water. And that's what uh, Paul is telling Timothy to do with this teaching, to immerse himself in it not sprinkle himself in occasional Bible reading or sprinkle himself in prayer, to fully immerse himself in the experience God has. And you, know, you may not notice when somebody comes in with a little water speak, sprinkled on their head, especially you know, in this weather, but uh, if I walked in completely drenched from head to toe, people would notice. And that's what he's saying here. If you immerse yourself in these teachings, if you immerse yourself in these things, people will notice your progress. People will see you and say, what on earth is up with that dude? <laughs> so, <clears throat> more sip of my unhealthy beverage. Finally, he says to keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Persist, the, <clears throat> persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So by keeping a close watch on our teaching, we're evaluating it, we're comparing it to the word of God. Um, you do that a lot when you're teaching. You, you know find other passages and make sure you're, what you're saying is what you should be saying, but really uh, as a Christian, we should be evaluating, you know, you, you should take my sermon back to the Bible and say, is, he, is what he says true? Um, the Berean Christians did that with Paul and Silas, I believe it was. Um, they took Paul's teaching, they compared it to the scripture and decided that he was in line with the scriptures. So we constantly need to be evaluating um, ourselves, evaluating our teaching and <clears throat> persisting in this you know we're in the race for the long run we have to finish that race we're not there to run so many miles and then quit we want to finish our race so um just as kind of a last note here for by doing so you will save yourself and your hearers this our uh, our teaching our persistence in doing good are showing each other the good news of Jesus Christ has eternal consequences. Whether we compromise with those people at the beginning of the chapter and say, well, well okay, fine, we'll let you have your add-ons to the gospel. And, or if we do what a good servant of Jesus Christ does in the, doing this in faith and of the good doctrine that we follow, the eternal consequences are pretty major. So um, with that, I'll uh, close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, the ability to immerse ourselves in it, the ability to read it and check ourselves, to check others, to check false teaching that may come into the church and uh, be able to reject that because we know you, we know your word, we know your gospel. And thank you so much for the good news that you came into the world to save sinners, the, of which I am the worst, Lord. And we stand before you humbled, and uh, we 
um, ask you to just uh, bless us as we go out and uh, spread this message, as we show it to others, as we get excited about it and uh, show it all around. In your name we pray. Amen.